Good morning, Calvary. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Can we just do this? I'd like to pray one more time before we open up God's word. Um, Holy Father, we come before you and we just ask that you can help prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the things that you want us to hear. We pray we're attentive to your spirit and attentive to your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to tell you what the most difficult thing about being a parent to a two-year-old is lately. My son, his name is Gabriel, and he's, he'll be two and a half in June. And Gabriel, is, he's getting older, he's getting bigger, and Gabriel now wants a little bit more freedom in his life. Uh, for instance, he doesn't want to sit in his high chair anymore. He wants to sit in the big boy chair. Uh, he doesn't want to climb the or want us to carry him up the stairs. He wants to climb the stairs. He doesn't want to sit in his stroller anymore. He wants to walk. And uh, parents, you know this, that we both know it's way easier for both parties if, if I help, right? We both know there's less mashed potatoes that gets in our ears and in our noses. It's just a whole lot easier if I, if I were to help, but, but he's at this stage in time. That's him. He's cute. It, it, you can't say no to him either. That's the problem. Like, how do you say no? But he wants this freedom. He, he, he wants to be able to make his own decisions. He wants to be able to do things without the help of other people. He's desiring and craving a little bit more freedom. And I keep hearing, just wait until he's in his teenage years. And I'm sure we'll get it figured out by then, I hope. Uh, but wait, he, he wants more freedom. And there's something, there's something about uh, the human beings, right? There's something about us that even in our earliest years, we crave freedom. We love independence. We want to be able to do things on our own, and we don't want anyone to have to restrict us uh, when we're attempting to do the things that we want. We crave freedom. There's something inherent in the human being that wants our own freedom in this way. But I think the problem that we have noticed is that especially, sometimes even more so, and we don't know why this is, but even more so in religious circles, it can feel like that is the least free place on the planet. That can feel like in religious circles, it can feel like there's less joy, there's more restrictions, there's more barriers put in place. And it can feel as if, if we are not careful, that, that the church of God can become a place that is actually the least free place on, on, in the world. So the question I, I, I want to propose to us is how do we become a people? How do we become a people that operates in the freedom of Christ? What does that even mean to operate in the freedom of Christ? I'm glad you're here this morning because today is the very first Sunday of a brand new series we're starting in the book of Galatians. And Galatians is a book all about freedom. It's all about freedom. And we're going to look at the first couple of verses uh, in Galatians today. I'm going to encourage you that these are the verses that, at least when I read it, I kind of just quickly skim through. So I'm going to encourage you to just laser focus with me as we read these first couple verses of Galatians. So stay with me on this here. And my hope and my goal today is to give us this almost this introduction and overview of Galatians so that we can take it with us as we go into the coming weeks. Does that make sense? Are you with me on this? Are you guys ready? We're going to hear the first couple verses. This is from the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1. It says this, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oftentimes, when you and I read the Bible, we believe that it was written to me individually and personally. And it's not a surprise. Like we live in the most individualistic culture, probably in human history. We value independence. You do your thing. I'll do my thing. I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. As long as that doesn't get in my way, we'll be fine. We value independence. So it's no surprise that we read this into this when we read the Bible, that we bring this individualistic, individualistic mindset into it when we read the Bible. But Paul in these first couple of verses, this is big, don't miss this. Paul in the first couple of verses, he tells us exactly who he's writing to. 
He says, I'm writing to the churches, plural, the churches in Galatia. Galatia is a province that's in modern day Turkey. Multiple communities of God, followers of Jesus, churches of Jesus, multiple. And even more than that, when Paul wrote these letters, he didn't just like put the word of God in an envelope, put a postage stamp on it and like send it in the mail. Uh, like, like I, I think we would normally think he, he sent a representative to go and read this passage out loud in front of everyone, in front of all of the churches out loud. It's much different than how you and I would, would think about our own personal quiet de, uh, de, devotional time, right? I'm not putting one against each other. They're both good, but it's just very different. Even more than that, Many of us have this picture, at least for me, I had this picture that when Paul wrote these books of the Bible, that he was in a dark room, like on a mountaintop by himself with a dim lit fireplace in the background. He's sketching out the word of God. But most scholars believe that Paul actually wrote these letters in community. And Paul's not shy about this. Actually, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians and Philippians and the 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He, he says that he wrote this book together with Silvanus and Timothy, and he wrote it in community that this is a book about community for community. Why am I telling you this? Why is this important? Because there may be wisdom that you and I can gain from Galatians individually, and we should. But this book is written as a charge to the church of God. There is a corporate responsibility, a, a corporate weight that we all bear together. So church of God, that's you and me, church of God, can we all collectively come into agreement to open our eyes, to open our ears, to open our hearts, the things that God just might say to the church of God? Because while it may po be possible, while it may be possible to succeed at these things individually, it can still be just as possible to fail at them in a communal setting. Church of God, can we collectively come into agreement to open our eyes and open our ears to things that God might have to say to us this morning in the coming weeks? Can we get an amen on that? Amen. So Paul says something else really weird in the first verse of Galatians. He says that he's not saying these things to the people of Galatians under his own authority. These are not ideas that he's come up with on his own. Nobody else gave him these ideas. No organization sent him on his way. He says that he is operating, get this, he is operating under the authority of Jesus Christ. Which is a really ironic thing to say for a book that's all about freedom. At least for us, we think that the true definition of freedom means when I can remove myself from all authority. When I have no one telling me how to live my life. When I have no one telling me what it looks like or what I should do or how I should live or who I should be, removing ourselves from authority. But Paul opens this up. He opens this up by saying that true freedom, get this, true freedom is found when we position ourselves under the authority of Jesus. True freedom is found when we position ourselves under the authority of Jesus. Authentic, lasting, life-changing freedom comes when we are placed under the authority of Jesus. And I'm going to pause there. What emotions come to your mind when you hear that? What thoughts start to surface and level when I tell you that freedom comes when you have to position yourself under the authority of Jesus? Because at best, it could be, well, I don't want some man who lived 2,000 years ago to tell me how to live my life. But at worst, this, this idea could make you uncomfortable because every position of authority that you've been placed under has caused you harm. And this makes you very nervous. It is my hope. It's my goal that hopefully by the end of this message that you would at least gain a new perspective of what life could look like under the freedom of Jesus. And it is my hope that you would be compelled to willingly follow Jesus into that freedom. So why did Paul write this book in Galatians? In order to answer that, we're going to take a few steps backwards and it's going to feel like I'm going to warn you. It is going to feel like I'm getting off course, like I'm going in a completely bunny trail uh, kind of course of action here. Stay with me. This is important. Are you ready? The very beginning of Israel's history, God made a promise with Abraham. 
said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Your descendants are going to outnumber the stars. They're going to outnumber the sand on the beach, and I will make you into a great nation. I will be, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And God enters this unique, this never-seen-before unique relationship with the people of Israel. And the purpose, the purpose of Israel at that time was so that they could be the conduit. They could be the, the, uh, the ones who bear the name of God and they could go forth and do the work of God in the world today so that, so that they could be a blessing to the nations. So that every other nation could know that the God of Israel is a compassionate, is a loving, is a God of truth and justice. And the goal was to create this nation that would go out to be a blessing to the nations. It's the entire story of the Old Testament, and I would argue of all of Scripture. And in order to do that, God understood that Israel was going to get this wrong. He understood that Israel could not be this unique nation if they were just like every other nation. So God gave them this Old Testament law, this Old Testament code, not just to give them a bunch of rules, but to set them apart. It's what it means when he calls them a holy nation. It means that they're set apart. They are a different kind of nation. And he gives it to them. And one of the things that God gave in order to set the Israelites apart from everyone else was the gift of, are you ready for it? Circumcision. The gift of circumcision. It was meant to be, I noticed a lot of the dudes laughed at that as if that's not a, an actual gift. <laughs> but it was meant to be this, this physical representation, this physical representation that they are set apart, that they are different so that they could be a blessing to the nations. Get this, understand this. The purpose of circumcision, the idea of it, the goal was it was always so that the outsider, the foreigner could come to know who God was. It was the entire purpose of circumcision. For you and I, for our modern ears, this is very weird. This is very weird. And if you're here today and you don't know what circumcision is, Pastor Jonathan said he'd be more than happy to talk to you about this. <laughs> he's in the lobby, he's, he's, got, he's got a whole spiel planned out, so he'll talk to you. But this is weird, right? Let's acknowledge it. It's weird. We don't get this. For our modern ears, it is strange that God would require this of the Israelites. However, for the ancient Israelites, we can't discredit this. For the ancient Israelites, this was a beautiful gift. It was a beautiful gift. Essentially what it's saying that at the very core of your identity, that God was going to be at the center of this. At the very core of how you would reproduce and be fruitful and multiply and extend your generations, that God was going to be at the very center of this. At the very core of how you express intimacy and pleasure with other people, that this was a gift from God and God would be at the very center of this. And though it may sound weird to us, this was a beautiful gift to the ancient Israelites. And the promise was this, that if you wanted to be a part of the family of God, you would be circumcised and you too could enter into that promise to be a blessing to the nations, to be a part of God. God's family. The entire goal was always, remember, to be a blessing to the nations. And then when Jesus comes to earth, Jesus comes to earth and he says, hey guys, I have fulfilled, I have fulfilled all Old Testament laws, including circumcision. I love the translation that Tim Mackey from the Bible Project, he says that he, Jesus came to fill full the Old Testament law, to fill it full. Essentially what this means is he brought that law to completion, that he, he accomplished what it originally set out to do. And when Jesus died and he rose from the dead, he flings open the doors wide that what used to be a unique relationship between the God of Israel and all of the people of Israel is now widely available to everyone, that anyone can enter the family of God. How many of you guys are grateful that you don't have to be born in ancient Israel to be part of the family of God? That is really, really good news. It's available to everyone. So for the first time ever, after, the, the, after these doors have been flung open, that Jews and Gentiles have come together. Gentiles or anybody who was not from Jewish heritage. They were coming together at rates and amounts never seen before. And they were worshiping together. Two very different cultures, two very different people were coming together and worshiping Jesus together. A beautiful image of God's new creation where all come together to worship. So beautiful. However, 
How many of you know that when two very different cultures and very different ethnicities come together, it can create tension? It can create tension. And this is what was happening in Galatia. And Paul wrote this book because there were Jewish leaders, Jewish followers of Jesus that were coming to the church of Galatia who were primarily Gentiles. And they were telling them, hey, in order for you to be part of the family of God, you still need to be circumcised. You still need to be circumcised. And what they were doing is they were adding on to what Jesus has already declared had been filled full had already been completed. And this is problematic for two reasons. The first is that it's a form of legalism. Legalism is a Christianese word um, that essentially is anytime that you add on or had, add higher requirements or higher standards than what Jesus has put in place and attempt to make yourself better or to make yourself more moral, essentially what they're saying is that the gift of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, faith in Jesus is not enough, that you have to have be circumcised too. And Paul's not happy about this. But there's a second reason, and I think it's even more sinister. Essentially what they were saying is that in order for you to be a part of the family of God, you need to leave behind your culture and adopt our culture instead. You need to leave behind your traditions and adopt our traditions instead. How many of you know that even in 2024, that ain't flying? Paul was not happy about this. He says, you guys are coming in and you are restricting the freedom that Christ has given you and you're putting unnecessary barriers, bondage, and chains on front of people that Jesus never placed on them. And Paul is making this argument. He says, you are, are leaving behind the freedom that Jesus has given you. What are you doing? Leave this behind. Get this. The problem with the Jewish leaders, it was not, this is so important, stay with me. It was not that the Jewish leaders were too strictly adhering to God's word and God's law. It is not that they were too strictly adhering to the authority of God's law. The problem was that they were not under the authority of God's law at all. Remember, the purpose of circumcision was always so that the blessing could be extended to the outsiders, so that the nations could come in. These Jewish leaders were now using it to do the exact opposite, to keep them out. They were not under the authority of, of God's law at all. Remember, freedom, real, true, authentic freedom comes when we position ourselves under the authority of Jesus and his word. When we position ourselves under the authority of Jesus and his word. And Paul is not happy about this. And you may be thinking, it's like, well, this is good news. I don't know the last time that we've checked to see who was circumcised around here. I'm going to say never. <laughs> we don't care about this anymore, right? Like, we don't check anybody at the door, you know. Uh, we don't, when you sign up for something, there's no tab. Say, are you circumcised or uncircumcised? Like, we don't do that, right? Why? Because we don't care about that in our culture, right? In our culture, in our day and age, it's, it's not a big deal. To them, it was. For us, it's not. So we don't care about it. So it can be easy to think, well, I guess we're kind of off the hook then because we're not doing this. But here's the thing. Galatians is about circumcision, but it's not about circumcision. It's about circumcision, but it's actually not about circumcision. And there are so many modern contexts that we will put in place of that. So let me give you a couple examples. It may not be circumcisions, but we may ask, well, how could you be a follower of Jesus and listen to that kind of music? May not be circumcision, but how could you be a follower of Jesus and look like that? May not be circumcision, but how could you be a follower of Jesus and believe that part of theology in the Bible? You're not ready for this one. May not be circumcision, but how could you be a follower of Jesus and be a part of that political party? Oh. 
Paul is saying that we have put barriers up on place that Jesus has never sent. Please hear me on this. Please hear me. What I am not saying is this. I am not saying that Jesus will never challenge or speak to our belief systems, our actions, our way of life. I am not saying that. Remember, if we are under Jesus' authority, we're under his authority. But what I am saying is this. We need to be very careful when we put expectations and boundaries on people that Jesus has never placed. This is what Galatians is all about. So next question that you could be having is, well, why would I even want this freedom anyway? Why couldn't I just get my own freedom somewhere else and not have to be placed under the authority of Jesus? And here's what I believe is true. I believe that this is the entire story of the Bible. I truly believe that when the church of God, the community of God is placed under the authority of Jesus, when we position ourselves on the authority of him in his word, that hearts are healed, that sins are forgiven, that the poor are served, the foreigner is welcomed, that truth and justice stand tall, and that those who are on the outside looking in get to be part of the family of God. This is the kind of freedom that Paul talks about. So if you are here today, my encouragement is this. that we would prayerfully reflect upon our own lives in the coming days. What expectations, what burdens, what boundaries have I unintentionally or intentionally placed on other people that Jesus has never placed there? And my encouragement to you would be this, to uproot those things from your heart and to reposition yourself under the authority of Jesus and his word. Because I believe, and I think Paul believes it too, that freedom can be gained in access when we are truly under his authority. And Paul begs us in Galatians, do not abandon the freedom that Christ has given you. What things are in our hearts that need to be uprooted so that way we can position ourselves under the authority of Jesus again? We're gonna have the worship team come back up as we close. The other re very real possibility that I wanna be sensitive to as well is that there could be two different groups of people here. There are the, the people who have grown up in the church or been a part of the church and this is kind of who we are, it's our identity and we've been a part of this and we need to hear this message. But there's also a very real possibility that, that you feel like you are that outsider that you feel like you have been on the outside looking in for so long and, and everything that you have seen about the community of God has turned you away from him rather than turned towards you. And here's, here's my encouragement to you. If that is you and you feel like you're the outside looking in or you're trying to come here today and you're listening to this because you feel like this is your one last opportunity to get your life back in order, here's my encouragement to you today. That the same promise, the same promise that was made available to Abraham that God will partner with him and he will never leave them, no matter how difficult or how badly they screw it up, that that same promise is available that God will stay with you. And that there is a higher calling on your life that leads you into freedom, that you can be a blessing to the people around you, a blessing to the nations. That promise to be, get this, to be a part of the family of God is an invitation that is made freely to you. And no moral standing, no religious code, no set of beliefs is able to enter that on your own. All it is, all it takes is to position yourself under the authority of Jesus. What does that mean? It means to trust in the name of Jesus. To place the center of your being fully in the hands of God and to say, Jesus, I trust you with my whole being. I trust you with my everything. And what you will find, what you will find is when you do that, there is forgiveness of sins. That everything that has held you back, everything that has made you feel guilty or shameful or broken or dirty, that there is cleansing, there is forgiveness of sins. 
Your past is not holding on to you any longer. And you get to be a part of the family of God. You get to be a part of the family of God. So if that is you, the invitation is to cling to Jesus. You are welcome. You may have not heard this before. You may have, everyone else has told you maybe anything else but this, but I'm telling you here today, you are welcome in the family of God. You are welcome in the family of God. As we go throughout the book of Galatians in the coming weeks, I hope we can hold to that freedom and that we cling to it with all of our being. Let's pray. Jesus, everything in our life, every voice that we have come in contact with, it, it, it tells us that you do not love us. It says that we're not worthy to be with you, that you don't want anything to do with us until we have our life in order. But God, we know and we've come to believe that that is not the voice of your name or your son that you would move heaven and earth to enter into relationship with humanity again. And you are calling anyone who has ears to hear, to ears to listen, anyone who has a heart that is ready to receive it, that they too can be part of this family of God. And Lord, I pray that we cling to that invitation and we never lose sight of the freedom that we have in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Guys, let's stand and let's worship.